Welcome everyone to day two of the 2020 Mid-Year Meeting. I hope you've all been enjoying the excellent presentations by authors or discussants. I also hope that those of you who are students or in the early years of your career have had an opportunity to take part in our mentoring and professional development sessions. Before we begin our lunchtime plenary, I have the pleasure of announcing the location of the 2021 Mid-Year Meeting. So for those of you who've been with us for a long time, you'll know that for over the past decade, this annual event has brought the society to many different cities and regions with the goal of strengthening the society's connections with scholars, practitioners, and students in international law and related disciplines. The event has taken place in every region of the country from Atlanta to Seattle, from Los Angeles to Chicago, from St. Louis to New York. We're hopeful that by next fall, it will be safe for us to meet <clears throat> in person. And so we invited proposals from our academic partner institutions to host next year's mid-year meeting. I'm very pleased to announce that our site selection committee has selected the University of Miami School of Law to host the 2021 mid-year meeting. We're excited to return to Miami and I wanted to thank the School of Law for a really wonderful proposal. I also wanna thank our mid-year meeting site selection committee, which included Ben Heath, Kish Perella, and Leila Sadat for their really careful review of the proposal and their wonderful work. We'll announce the date of the meeting in the near future, but meanwhile, we can all look forward and southward to enjoying good fellowship next fall. So I'm also pleased to announce the call for proposals for our next signature topic. Our current topic, as you know, is international law and climate change, That'll continue through 2022, and the new topic will be announced at the 2021 annual meeting in March. So please stay tuned. So with that, let's get to our lunchtime plenary, which promises to be exciting. As many of you know, the Society has featured a series throughout the fall entitled International Law and the 2020 Presidential Election, What is at Stake? The series has featured an extraordinary array of current and former US government officials and experts from both sides of the US political divide discussing critical international law issues that will be profoundly affected by the results of the election, however it turns out. I wanna thank the ACLA program committee chaired by David Bowker for the hard work and ingenuity they've put in organizing the series. If you've missed any of the programs, I encourage you to watch them online at www.acel.org 2020 election. We conclude the series with this stellar panel. It's entitled Multilateralism and the U.S. Role on the Global Stage. Our distinguished moderator is David Sullivan, Deputy General Counsel of the World Bank. David previously held senior positions in the Office of the Legal Advisor at State Department as Deputy Legal Advisor in the NSC in both the Bush and Obama administrations and as the Assistant General Counsel for International Affairs in the U.S. Department of the Treasury. In each of these roles, he has overseen U.S. engagement with international organizations, including the U.N. and specialized agencies. He's also served as lead U.S. negotiator for several international legal instruments and at the establishment of several international institutions, including the Global Fund to Fight HIV AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. David, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for being with us, and it's over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'll just dispense with housekeeping in the at housekeeping at the front end, which is that as a deputy general counsel of the World Bank, um, any comments I make here are purely my own and nothing to do with the World Bank. Um, so here we are at the last of ASEL's uh, panels on international law on the presidential 2020 election. Uh, this one on multilateralism and international institutions. Um, earlier panels have focused on trade and investment, climate change and the environment, and use of force of counter and counterterrorism. So there are many US specific tools and international tools to deal with each one of these um, particular topic areas. And of course, um, multilateral tools uh, that um, uh, are pushed through international organizations and multilateral instruments. So both the Republican and Democratic administrations have approached multilateralism in different ways over the years. Um, but this is uh, a new administration in which we've seen um, uh, a rejection of international engagement, uh, the likes of which we haven't seen before. Um, to put the approach in stark view, on July 6th, the United States, um, the country that's at the epicenter of the global pandemic, served its notice of withdrawal to the World Health Organization, an organization it helped to establish and build in part to address global pandemics. 
In doing so, it cited the ongoing need to engage in international health issues, but to do so with more credible and transparent partners. It also cited um, the failure of the World Health Organization um, to uh, disengage from the Chinese Communist Party. Um, with what is the strategic uh, vision behind this approach and other approaches to multilateral institutions? What does the future hold in the second Trump term? Um, and what would, how would it reimagine our international engagement? What are the alternatives? With, the, with these actions, are there US partners willing to reimagine the framework of multilateralism alongside the United States? Here to channel these views of the Trump administration is Ambassador Pierre Prosper. As many of you know, Ambassador Prosper served as the US ambassador at large in charge of the Secretary of State's Office of War Crimes issues in the Bush administration. In addition to engaging with the heads of state and international organizations on atrocities, attacks against civilians, and other issues within the broad remit of the Office of War Crimes, Ambassador Prosser was key US interlocutor with the International Criminal Court. Prior to taking up his post, Ambassador Prosper notably served as a career official in the Clinton administration, in the State Office of War Crimes, and the Department of Justice, and as a war crimes prosecutor for the International Crib Criminal Tribunal in Rwanda. The Biden administration takes a different approach. As its stated posture, a Biden administration would reverse the last four years of disengagement um, and re-enter the Paris Agreement, the World Health Organization, restart the JPO, JCPOA, and other international engagements. But is a revision to the status quo ante advisable or even possible given the skepticism that affects the way that some of our allies view our, uh, our alliances? To what degree is a simple re-engagement possible or even advisable? Since the creation of the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions and follow on international organizations, there has been a perception that US engagement in these institutions has been key to advancing US interests globally, both through the values espoused by these institutions, as well as the leveraging of US financial interests. Does this premise still hold? Here to channel the views of the Biden administration is Tess Bridgman. Tess is co-editor in chief of Just Security and senior fellow and visiting scholar at NYU's Rice Center on Law and Security. She served as special assistant to President Obama, associate counsel to the president and deputy legal advisor to the National Security Council, where she advised on the full range of issues relating to national security and foreign policy in the United States. Prior to her service in the Obama administration, Tess served in a variety of capacities in the State Department's Office of Legal Advisor. So um, first to Pierre, with that introduction and channeling the incumbent, can you make the case for the Trump administration positions with respect to multilateral institutions and multilateralism, multilateralism more generally? Um, do you agree that the characterization is fair? And if not, how would you characterize uh, what we have seen over the last four years? Well, um, David, thank you um, for the, uh, the introduction. And Catherine, thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share views with you as to how I see the, the particular situation and um, the approach of the current administration. Uh, I am not uh, part of the cur current administration, nor am I part of the campaign, but, but I'll be speaking to you as uh, not only an observer, but someone that comes with more of a, a Republican perspective to, uh, to some of these issues. And, um, will be able to give you my opinion. David, I think I'll start off with the, 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 the main question or one of the questions you ask is whether the characterization is, is fair, that there is a, a, a rejection of multilateral and international uh, engagement, international organizations. And I, and I would say that it is not fair I think while the, the president's rhetoric is very um, um, sharp and, 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 and aggressive on some of these issues, I think if you look at what is actually happening, you'll see that uh, there is more engagement than, than one would, would actually think or presume. And I say that for, for a few reasons, not only because of the, the factual reality of some of the things that have been happening, but also because I think the reality is it, is it is impossible for the United States or any nation for that matter to not have multilateral engagement or engage with international organizations. The issue really is more how to engage and what to expect from these institutions. 
And I think what you're seeing from the administration is the administration is really now, instead of, instead of just accepting and taking for granted the current structure of these particular organizations, it is pushing back and is asking more from these organizations and trying to put into balance or calculate how much the United States should be responsible for vis-a-vis -vis what others. And I think as the administration states uh, regularly on these issues is that, or the president himself, is that he's looking for a fair deal for the United States. And a fair deal, I believe in his mind, is a fair deal financially, because over the years we have seen that the United States is paying the lion's share of the, of the dues and the cost for many of these organizations, such as the WHO, which we'll talk about. And it's looking at uh, a fair deal in the sense of responsibility, because you have many states that are out there that are part of these organizations or part of these these treaties that are signing them and are, are making commitments that they are not adhering to. So when you, when you hear this, I think you have to look at it in that context to see what the administration is trying, trying to do. And I think that the administration is, is pushing back to try to, to find a, a, a balance. Now, the way they're doing it may, they are doing it may not be the way that many of us would like to see it done, but I think the reality is that there needs to be a recalibration of these issues so that we, the United States, are one, not taken for granted, and two, not, taking, be, not, not being taken advantage of in these situations. I'll quickly touch upon the WHO, just since you referenced it before, I'll, I'll pause, and I know that uh, Tess uh, will have an opportunity to, to, uh, to speak, but I think the WHO is a, is a perfect example. Now, what the, of course, the administration's rhetoric was very harsh on this issue. But if you look at the WHO and as it relates to China, which I know we'll talk about more uh, later, according to the administration, the United States is paying roughly $450 million uh, to, this, to this entity. Uh, I don't have the details of how and the annuals or whatever it may be. But in comparison, China is again, according to administration, paying 40 million, four zero. China has a population of 1.3 billion people compared to ours that were roughly, you know, the upper three, 300 uh, million people, uh, official numbers, and maybe over 400 million people, uh, you know, unofficially. So you can see that we are paying a, a huge portion of this. But as the administra administration is saying, or at least believes, China is, be, is able to exert more influence on the, on the WHO than we are in a sense where, where, where they're not being held accountable for certain things. And I think what the administration is saying is, is we need to find a balance here. One, not only economic, we're putting all this money in and we're not seeing the returns that we should be receive, seeing. And two, the accountability should be should be spread across and be universal. It shouldn't be selective you know, accountability. But I know we can dive into this more deeply and I'll stop here um, so for us to continue. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. I think we'll tease out uh, each of those particular issues going forward. But before we do, I'd like to give Tess an opportunity to um, challenge my characterization um, of uh, or my questions of, is this business as usual? In the new Biden administration, um, looking at the last four years, um, what, how would the Biden uh, administration approach its reentry to multilateralism? Thanks, Dave, and very happy to be here. Um, echo the the sentiments of my co-panelist, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, I, I think the the starting point for a Biden reentry is that there there is a a vision and a coherence behind our foreign policy and our multilateral engagement writ large. I think it's it's easy for us to try to find uh, through lines to the Trump foreign policy and and try to impose some sort of framework on it that that represents a coherent vision. But I think we also have to keep in the back of our minds uh, the the possible alternate um, description of the reality we find ourselves in right now, and that we could find ourselves in for four more years uh, should Trump win re-election, which is that there is no 
approach to multilateralism other than what benefits President Trump himself, and that it's not, in fact, a pursuit of American interests so much as a pursuit of President Trump's personal interests uh, or those of his his close family members. Um, and I think there's a, a, a recognition on the part of, of the, the Biden administration, and in fact, I think, you know, the the more traditional Democratic and Republican foreign policy uh, community writ large, uh, that America does have interests uh, that that require cooperation to pursue. And I think Biden has said it well when he says the world does not organize itself, right? There, there is a, a, a mandate to write the rules of the road that belongs to those who participate in the drafting process. And that means being at the table. Uh, but as we know, with the, the disengagement that has characterized the last four years with the erraticism uh, and the self-dealing that has often characterized the Trump administration's approach, uh, the United States has a, a long way to go to regain credibility. Um, I think one of the things that Biden has very um, astutely observed is that that means starting with reinvigorating our democracy at home, uh, hypocrisy doesn't play well in multilateral engagement. Uh, and I think all powerful nations are at times uh, guilty of some degree of that. Um, but it's it's an imperative right now because of the state of our domestic institutions and the state of our of our foreign engagement that we we focus inward as we're trying to regain trust looking outward. Uh, and what does that mean? That means addressing things like uh, criminal justice reform, uh, voting rights, um, beneficial ownership and and anonymous shell companies, uh, you know, ending self dealing in terms of our domestic politics, um, respecting the free press, uh, having a humane and lawful immigration policy. These things all uh, are part of the Biden agenda that he has articulated as necessary components to restoring our moral leadership and our credibility before we can engage abroad in good faith with with credibility and, and regain the trust of our partners and advocating for the kinds of things uh, that uh, that I just mentioned, right, in, in terms of uh, human rights, anti-corruption, addressing authoritarianism. So all of those, I, I think, are the kind of the bigger vision uh, that there are, in fact, urgent problems in the world that require urgent solutions uh, that that require multilateral engagement to pursue. I think that's not something that we should take for granted as as something that the Trump administration uh, agrees, right? I, they they don't necessarily see climate change or global health uh, or some of these other really pressing issues as ones that require multilateral solutions. Uh, so I think the the overall approach uh, is certainly consistent with what we've seen in past administrations quite frankly, both Republican and Democratic, uh, in that it recognizes there are American interests that are also global interests that require global cooperation. But I think what's unique about this moment is Biden's recognition that we have to get our own house in order and being quite frank about that and speaking to that even, even in the context of a campaign uh, in order to, to be taken seriously on the global stage again. Um, I think that answers the first question. I'm sure we'll tease some of that out as we go on, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Tess. Um, I guess back to Pierre on some of those comments as well, which is that um, if I understand you correctly, your view is that or these organizations, well, multilateral organizations have not served us well. Um, need to be reimagined in some way, or maybe have served as well, but certainly need to be reimagined in both a um, financial burden capacity as well as a kind of who they are listening to and what our influence is inside those organizations. Um, and certainly, you know, the statements um, at, along the way by the Trump administration, I read one with respect to the WHO, um, to continue um, to challenge Chess's view, work on global health issues, but do so in a different way. Um, in the Rose Garden speech with respect to Paris, um, President Trump said that he was willing to immediately work with Democratic leaders to either negotiate our way back into Paris under terms that are fair to the United States and its workers or to negotiate a new deal that protects our country and its taxpayers. Um, that was years ago, uh, the beginning of the administration. Um, I'll note also in the JAM versus IFC case, um, the Solicitor General kind of echoed 
uh, similar sentiments, which is that the United States participation in international organizations is a critical component of the nation's foreign relations that reflects an understanding that robust multilateral engagement is a crucial tool in advancing the, na the national interest. So aligning with what you said, Pierre, um, which is that you need multilateral institutions, you need U.S. engagement with multilateral institutions. Um, but what does that look like? Um, there haven't been steps made uh, that I have been able to discern uh, to reinvent or reimagine uh, these institutions. As we know, um, creating a World Health Organization, creating a WTO, creating um, these organizations takes a uh, huge commitment um, and political commitment by the United States, goodwill um, with its allies and a common interest. How would the Trump administration approach that? Um, as Tess has argued, they, there has been some trust broken down with respect to U.S. leadership in the world. Um, what would the U.S. capitalize on to reimagine these institutions if it's not going to work within them? Okay, well, well thank you. Um, well, I, th I think probably the way to look at this uh, question is to, one, begin with the premise that um, just because the, these institutions exist, does not mean that they are working well and they are serving the interest of those they are supposed to serve, including, you know, obviously ours in the United States. These international organizations and some of these institutions have the, uh, the I guess, the ability and they, they, the, the trend of becoming entities into themselves and, and, and no longer essentially serving the, uh, the people or the governments that, they, that, that created them and they become their own organization that, that essentially do what they want to do. So uh, we need to recognize that. And, and, it, and I think that's a natural behavior, quite frankly. You know, it just happens people get into these institutions and they evolve and take on a life of their own. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to pull it back to be, to be able to bring it back into the, the framework that it was intended or or a framework that is now more appropriate given the passage of time and the, and the, you know, the evolution of history, if you will. So I guess what I'm saying is an institution that was perhaps created 50 years ago uh, may not necessarily as constituted be serving the, uh, the society or the world the way it should be now in 2020. So we need to look at that. And when you're dealing with uh, what the administration uh, can or should do or how you should deal with it, I think we also have to recognize that if you're seeking reform or if you're seeking to, to uh, you know, modify approaches, consistent with what we're talking about here, it can't be done unilaterally. Meaning just because the United States or the president wants it to happen, if it doesn't happen, you cannot blame, blame the president essentially for it. Now, of course, there may be things you can blame any administration for, but you need willing partners on the other side to want the reform. You need willing partners on the other side to say, yep, you're right, I will pay my fair share. You need willing partners on the other side to say, yeah, I, I see that we need a balance and accountability so that, this, so that we're not just going after certain big countries that other countries need to be, to be uh, uh, held to the, same, to the same standards. So while, while the approach that the aggressive approach that the president may be using may, may set some individuals or societies or nations back, aback because they're not used to that, that type of, uh, of uh, discussion, rhetoric, or approach. I think it is important, regardless of who's the next, pre the next president is, that we have to get, when we get to the table with these organizations, we have to look at these questions and look at it from a, a futuristic perspective to see how can we get these things to be not only functioning properly, but to have the credibility that want that allows us to be comfortable in our participation? And I think that is that is the um, you know the, the 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 key here. And I'll stop here. Um, sure, Pierre. One follow up from me. Um, taking the specific example of the WHO, um, we the United States has a stated interest in terminating its relationship with the WHO. We pull back our scientists. Uh, they collaborate with them. As we know, the WHO is much bigger than the coronavirus and other pandemics, but it gets into um, numerous diseases um, that affect um, uh, the countries least able to deal with them. Um, what would, uh, once that relationship is severed, 
what would a new engagement look like if we are not going to be working through organizations like that? And it's just one among, among others. Um, is this engagement with other partners to create a new multilateral initiative? Is this um, reaching out in bilateral relationships to coordinate um, responses with like-minded? Um, if it's not serving us well and we're not working within it, what does what fills the vacuum? Well, you know, I don't, uh, you know, first of all, I, I'm not privy to the, the efforts of reform that have been made or attempted to be made by this administration or prior administrations for that matter, because it's not my area of expertise. But I also do not necessarily view as the severance uh, that has taken place as one that is uh, permanent. You know, I, I, I view it as something that is uh, a, a pull, more of a pullback and that if the, the, the proper reform uh, takes place, then you could see the United States uh, resuming its, its, its involvement. And I think this goes to all of these type of institutions. It's, there's a purpose for each institution that's been created. And I think we can all, for the most part, uh, uh, agree to it. I mean, people may have their, their preferences, but I, they were created for a reason. Otherwise, you would not have gotten the United States involved initially, and you would not have gotten all these nations involved. But what happens is because many of these things take on a life of their own, they lose their way. And I think what the administration is trying to do, in a, in a, again, in a way that people may not agree with, is trying to recalibrate and bring things back in line to the intended purpose. Now, with the WHO, I think there, there obviously is a role for the WHO in the, in the world, and that goes well beyond uh, 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 COVID. Uh, but I think it's important that the leaders and administrators there know that you have to exercise your job in a fair, balanced, and responsible way. Thanks, Pierre. Um, Tess, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the points are well taken, Pierre, that there needs to be recalibration uh, as institutions grow older, as they were, uh, you know, formed to take on specific substantive matters perhaps that have evolved a great deal over time as global players capabilities and and various threats and challenges evolve i think that's always been the case and it always will be uh, with any institution uh, but i i would challenge the notion that we can in fact recalibrate through withdrawal uh, i think that's a, a a dangerous kind of prescription for disintegration rather than reformation uh, and and it's even at the at the very kind of technical level of how do you rewrite the rules without a seat at the table, right? So the the areas where, uh, and I think this is something Dave has reflected on, where we are um, participating even in a seat warming kind of capacity, uh, maybe there is an opportunity for reform there. And I think if there is a Biden administration, uh, it will certainly benefit to some degree of, uh, from having a more blank slate than usual, right? Um, coming in and, and being able to kind of take some bold new positions, um, but not in the instances, right, where we're in the outside looking in. Um, so that's just one notion that I, that I want to challenge. I think another thing, though, that's, that's important to challenge is the idea that all of our institutions are crumbling, right? So there are certainly some that are creaky and in, in dire need of reform, uh, certainly some where I don't hold out hope that we're going to get any meaningful reforms, like the Security Council um, might be one example. Um, but there are other institutions that are shiny and new that uh, even the Trump administration in some instances has not pulled back from, uh, others it has. Uh, so you have you know, the Global Fund for, for AIDS, TB, and malaria, the Green Climate Fund, which is now on the rocks, but uh, wasn't as of uh, relatively recently. Um, and, and there's, for the new ones and the old ones alike, I think a need to tend to them as they evolve and to to recalibrate those rules through our participation. Um, but I think one other point that I would, I would add there in terms of what does that um, you know, recalibration look like, it's, it's something that uh, I think Biden has been very astute in recognizing on the campaign trail because it, it dovetails quite nicely with a campaign message of support for the middle class and the working class, which is that uh, it, it needs to be apparent to the middle classes and working classes, not only in the United States, but also in our fellow democracies, that these institutions and these 
rules that have been written largely in the post-World War II era benefit them and don't just, uh, don't just benefit uh, someone somewhere else or a global elite, as it were, um, that, that from trade to environment and, and labor, uh, that there is a redounding benefit to democracies and to those in the middle and working classes, in particular in democracies, of having these institutions in place and of following their rules and of paying our dues. Um, and I think that's something that has been apparent for quite a long time, uh, arguably since at least the early 90s, uh, but certainly is something that I, I think we're seeing reflected in the rise of populist and authoritarian movements. Um, it's of course not all attributable to that, but there is I think a, a role, um, a multilateral role to be played in shoring up democracies more broadly, both ours and you know, our, our fellow democracies, which together we make up something like half of the world's GDP. Uh, and, and Biden has said, let's use that leverage. Let's use that substantial leverage that we have as a block of global democracies to reform these institutions in ways that benefit our democratic values, but that also benefit economically, quite frankly, um, those who need to believe in this endeavor, in the global system that we are upholding. Uh, so I think that um, vision of reform is one that it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't call for stagnation. It doesn't call for just leaving everything as it was, uh, you know, 10, 20, even 70 years ago. But it uh, but it is something that requires working from within the system rather than throwing stones from outside. Um, so I I'll, I will leave it at those few points, <laughs> uh, which touched on a couple of different themes, I think all of which were responding to uh, to the last intervention. But uh, Dave, I'm, I'm not sure if that's where you were planning to go next. Well, actually, Dave, let, let me let me jump in. We're, we're, we're now starting a debate, which is which is which is fun. And um, I don't, you know, for the most part, I don't disagree. But there are examples that I think will be contrary to the, the point you, you made. And I'll start with the, the severance, you know, being from the outside uh, looking in. Um, I do think it's possible to do both, uh, to be on the outside and still seek reform. And the, the reason I say that is because I saw my predecessor, Ambassador David Sheffer, do this with the ICC. If you recall in 1998, when the Rome Treaty was, um, was voted upon, Ambassador Sheffer was in the room trying to get these, uh, these uh, fixes for the United States, which we ultimately were not able to. And President Clinton decided to not sign the treaty. So we were effectively outside and, and criticized for it. And, but he was able to, while being on the outside and not, not a, a state party, in the subsequent years to be involved in helping shape some of the rules to try to... to uh, to better the rules in, in, in the interest of the United States of America, not only rules of procedures and evidence, but also rules relating to the rules of, of armed, armed conflict and the laws of, of aggression and things that are critical to our, our, to our service members. And, and he was very, very successful at that. And it, it is that, 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 that effort from the outside that ultimately caused some in the United States to become more comfortable with the United States Involvement now. There still is. We can talk about it later. There still is a divide in view as to whether or not we should become a state party. But his effort as an outsider brought it closer. So I do think it's it's possible because all of these institutions do want United States involvement. So even if we're officially severed, the WHO, for example, will want to find a way to bring us back in. And the question is, if when, when you're on the inside even if you make these, these requests, are they going to take you for granted and wonder, well, you're, you're not going to leave, so we'll, we'll get around to it or maybe not. I, you know, this, this will be up to the diplomats and their, and their strategic approach, but it's something to think about. And on, on the second point, I, I, th I, I agree with you that these institutions have to find a way to uh, serve and be attractive to the middle class. I think that's that that's critical, and not only the middle class to all to all classes, uh, because it is the people that need to be served, uh, and they need to see it, feel it, and appreciate it. And I think what happens a lot with these institutions 
is that they do become, um, you know, global elitists, if you will, and are serving, serving the, the either global elite society or serving themselves. And the people that are most affected are not, are not feeling it. In fact, if you look around the world on many of these issues, most of the progress is being made more at the NGO civil society level than through these, um, these international organizations. Because, because people feel that some of these organizations are just, are just out of touch. So I think this is where there is a common ground where you, you have to find a way as you move forward and make these reforms to have them reach the intended, uh, the, the intended recipient and so that, so that people have faith in it and that we can, we can rally around and support it, whether it is substantively or whether it is, it is saying we want to make it fair, whatever it may be. But I, Tess, I absolutely 100% agree with you that that's a, a critical criteria. So let me jump in there and ask the question is, are we painting with too broad of a brush? I mean, here and the topic that has been put before us is multilateralism, multilateral institutions. And we tend to be discussing these in mass as if there are creaky institutions, bright, shiny, new institutions, um, and institutions that have outlived their purpose. Um, I think it relates very much to the kitchen table politics that you all have referred to, which is these organizations or initiatives many times hide in plain sight. Um, who knows about the Montreal Protocol and its effect um, to stem uh, the depletion of ozone. Uh, it, it is fundamental um, and has been a fundamental success of global action, I think recognized by both parties as such. It continues on to this day, and it doesn't sit in the public debate as to whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for the U.S. engagement, whether that's something that um, we should continue to, um, uh, to show up at, and whether that could be that, that role could be fulfilled by civil society or, or NGOs. I mean, there are certainly technical bodies, the ICAO, IMO, um, others, the list goes on, IAEA, which lend themselves to um, global engagement. And it's by all measure, by many measures, um, have served us well over time. Um, these tend to get wrapped in the word globalist, um, you know, into globalism, that somehow they're all an inherent bad. Um, does this paint with too broad of a brush for one and for two, um, how to translate that to um, uh, um, the regular voter who would look at this and say that, you know, the, the, the world is so simple that there's multilateralism and unilateralism and multilateralism is inconsistent with a unilateralist approach. Tess, you want to take this one? <laughs> I can start. Sure. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, Dave, that's absolutely an astute uh, observation. I think one we all would agree with the, the question of how to translate it is a harder one in the current media environment. And I will say um, it reminds me of the uh, heroic and Herculean efforts of my former colleague and boss of Real Haynes, uh, who uh, gave a series of speeches and, and engaged um, in, in a, a series of efforts on the Hill to try to translate what we get out of uh, treaties, both ones that we're already party to and ones that uh, have, have long been pending, uh, um, to, to try to explain why it is that these benefit us in really direct and concrete ways. And it's not hard to come up with examples, uh, anything from the safety of our food uh, to you know, Montreal Protocol is a great example. Uh, really, bread and butter, day to day things. You know, the how we how we get our mail. Um, it's it's really concrete, tangible things, but uh, they're not um, when they're not broken. It's hard to sustain attention to them. Uh, so I think one of the the things that we fall victim to in our current media cycle, but also uh, just partly human nature, uh, prevention isn't as interesting as the train wreck. Uh, when you when you have a, I think public health is a great example. If we prevented the pandemic through taking um, you know, a series of concrete common sense steps that we all knew would work. Uh, if we had done that at the outset, um, those who did so may have gotten criticized for expending the funds even, right? Because they don't see the bad result that was prevented. Um, and that's something that's, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's not a new observation. That's not new to the, tr to the Trump era. Uh, but it is one that I think is exacerbated in our, our current media environment uh, that kind of goes from scandal to scandal. Uh, it's it's hard to take a minute and reflect and really get to 
voters, to middle class families, to working class families to, to talk about why it is that the international system um, can and does benefit us in myriad ways in our everyday lives all the time. Um, so that's, that's I think, I, I blame more... Um, you know, the, the way that we talk to each other and the news sources that we're, we're all currently paying attention to, uh, then the, the inability uh, to, to explain how these things actually, actually benefit us. And I think it is one that, it is an issue that we, we all ought to pay more attention to how, how to break through and really get it into uh, an area of mainstream attention. I do just want to turn back briefly, if I may, though, to one of, of the points that uh, Pierre raised uh, in, in response to the last round, um, which was about the efficacy of engaging from the outside. Uh, because I think the ICC actually is a very instructive example. Um, I, will, I will credit the team that was there and involved in the negotiations for, for doing as well as they did. And I think the, the, the atmosphere was a, a difficult one for the United States in a number of ways. Um, but having ended up on the outside rather than, than joining on the inside, it, it, for a time, did not ostracize us completely, um, but certainly made us far less effective. Uh, you know, that the hostility uh, in multilateral channels that we've seen, that's a, a very difficult cycle to break, is, is one way that we see that manifest. But even on a very concrete level, uh, not having a vote at the Assembly of State Parties has hurt us and has hurt our ability uh, to stick up for our allies in situations where we thought uh, we, we needed to do so. Um, and that's a, a kind of a, a concrete example of a way in which uh, being on the outside certainly doesn't mean that you can uh, never have any influence at all. We, we often manage to do so, um, but it hurts our ability to be effective and it hurts our ability to, to you know, use all our cards on the table. Um, so just uh, to, to kind of close out though where we were um, a moment ago, uh, I, I think, you know where we go. Uh, where we go from here depends on recognizing that um, we need to participate to be effective. We need to make the case to the middle class to sustain that over time. Um, but we also, I think, need to recognize that this isn't a, a problem that's unique to Trump or unique to Biden. And it's something that I think our our entire community should should probably. Uh, put uh, a, a real Haynes level attention uh, into going forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, quickly, uh, you know, respond because I know you may want to get on to other things. You know, I think, I think on the, on the, the last point, it, I, you know, I mean, this can, will sound very, you know, abstract and, but how do you, how do we define participation? Because you could participate without, by not participating. So your your non participation may be a statement a, in a way that 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 triggers a reaction that could be you know beneficial that allows a you know a, a a negotiation to begin or to continue and the concern is that by by always acquiescing and sitting at the table and also let's keep talking about it if the other side is holding the cards they they may take you for for granted now this is a like a global proposition, it's it's um, a st strategic calculation, and it may or may not be appropriate in certain circumstances. But I don't think we should automatically uh, dismiss uh, non-participation as being outside of a negotiation uh, a process. Meaning we're completely excluded. It could be running in in uh, in, in in parallel. Uh, and now, David, to answer your your question. I think you're. I think you're right. That the. I was about to say the average person. I think, but he, but the average and even more than average person does not understand what these organizations are are doing or are capable of doing, and therefore it's hard for them to uh, support it. Whether it's here in the United States or, or uh, you know, pick your continent around the world, and there is also there's also the flip. The other side of this, which is there are people who have an exaggerated expectation from these organizations because they don't know. They think that, it, that they're the, the end all be all. So, so I think one of the problems that we're seeing and the reason that there's this difference in views between the Biden administration, uh, potential Biden administration and the Trump administration is 
is exactly that, is that there's probably not a clear consensus as to what these organizations should actually be doing and what they're capable of doing. And, and one side, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, passing judgment or anything, one, there, one side could be we expect a lot, we believe that they can do a lot. There's another side that feels that they, 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 they can't do much and that we're was- they're wasting our time. So I think we have to find a consensus as to what these organizations are actually able to do. And I think that's important because once that is identified, then we as states and societies will know what our role is within this. Because one of the concerns that I have across the board is that people, states will abdicate their responsibility and put them all into these organizations international or multilateral organizations, because it's easy. It's an easy policy decision to say, well, let's just send 450 million to the WHO and let them deal with it. And we don't have to think about it until the train wreck happens, (laughs) as as Tess said. But when the reality is, is all these institutions should be in parallel or in tandem with domestic processes and responsibilities. I'll stop there. Thanks, Pierre. I'd like to shift gears a little bit to a theme that Pierre brought up at the beginning with respect to WHO. Um, and it definitely, as I brought it up at the beginning, impacts US engagement with the WTO and other institutions, which is the US relationship with China. And Pierre, you said um, something that caught my attention, which is you can participate by non participation. And in non participation in organizations, uh, pick one, um, or as we sever our ties and pull out of organizations, um, do we cede influence um, to others in these organizations? It, I think there's been a, a recognition by by many that um, since World War II, the multilateral institutions, um, the UN and others, and the Bretton Woods institutions have you know been promoting um, democracy, free free trade, other sorts of things which are more aligned with um, United States vision of the world. As we and if we um, recede in our engagement through these institutions, um, do we cede ground and how does that impact the sort of the US-China relationship? Um, you brought this up with respect to the WHO. Um, it certainly looms large there. It's just loomed large in the WTO uh, elections over the last day or two. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Pierre? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a fascinating question. And I think Ch- China is a great, great example because um, China, in my view, is gaining influence in these organizations, not by participating in the organizations. I mean, they're there, but what China is doing, it's, it's the series of bilateral engagements that they have, that they are working on, working very, very hard, that is bubbling up to influence what is happening within these international organizations. And we're taking a bit of a different approach. We, we, we're coming in at the international level, expecting it to all happen at that table. When, when, when you have countries such as China and others that are working from the ground up and using whatever influence leverage that they may have and are getting these states, once they're in that seat in those rooms, to vote in their favor uh, for, for whatever the issue may be. So, um, when you talk about are we ceding influence, I, you know, I, uh, I, I would say no. I, I think what the United States needs to be doing is we need to get back to the hard diplomatic efforts and really get in, get into those bilateral settings and really working it and working it as it bubbles up into the international uh, uh, framework. I suppose uh, no surprise. I would I would challenge the the notion that we are not seeding influence. Uh, I think we're, we're absolutely seeding influence in in a series of of steps that we've taken, and I, I think it's we could probably agree. I would hope that we're never going to be as effective with a series of bilateral one off engagements as we would be if we had a, a block of democracies working towards common ends. Uh, and I, th- I think that's something that we, um, you know, we need to be very mindful that the, the, the question of how to adapt our multilateral institutions as China is rising is, 
is a bit of a um, it's a, it's a quandary in two different directions, right? On the one hand, uh, there are you know absolutely valid arguments towards accommodating the interests of uh, states that have been locked out of uh, uh, you know key positions of of influence and power and institutions that were uh, you know set up before uh, before their rise. On the other hand, um, you know the I think we can see things like the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the the recent um, you know activity towards Hong Kong, but as in addition Taiwan, um, the uh, let's absolutely not forget to 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 speak to the atrocities occurring uh, with respect to the Uyghurs in China. These are very dangerous, destabil destabilizing. Um, you know, uh, illegal actions uh, that we can't just speak to bilateral. And yeah, now we we need to speak to them bilaterally. We absolutely need to be using our voice um, and regaining moral authority in order to do so. And and uh, Biden has been very clear about that. Uh, but in terms of then how how do we reshape? Um, you know, the, the power politics in the region? How do we shore up our partners who are being uh, run roughshod over by China? Um, those are things that we can't do alone. And I think abandoning TPP is one place where we certainly ceded influence. Uh, it's absolutely no secret that one of the goals of, of TPP uh, was checking China's influence in the region. Um, you know, I think that the WHO, of course, uh, is another example. Uh, walking away just sort of seeds the terrain uh, to China uh, rather than um, than trying to engage uh, to, to reshape how, you know, how that uh, institution uh, functions with a strong role for China, even if it's one that we don't always uh, like. Uh, you know, I think stepping back uh, completely um, makes the situation worse, not better. So uh, I would I would challenge the notion that we aren't ceding ground, but I would also, I think more important for looking forward, challenge the notion that a series of bilateral engagements um, will, will be as effective or will help us speak with the moral authority that we would have if we speak as a block of democracies, uh, which is something that Biden's been really strong on. Uh, his his uh, kind of, you know, opening... Um, uh, um, salvo to the international community as the U.S. Uh, in a in a Biden administration, should there be one, um, that he's put on the table as a summit for democracies. Uh, that is very much uh, uh, an effort to counter China's influence in a way that is consistent with U.S. values, with you know U.S. Uh, regaining of its its moral legitimacy and and a leadership role, uh, but also then uses that block strategically uh, in ways that that counter China's influence uh, that uh, both in its its region and and more broadly. Um, so I think the the difference couldn't be more stark uh, than it is with respect to China, even though I would say Biden agrees with Trump that that China is, you know, unfairly subsidizing its companies, it's stealing intellectual property. There, there are plenty of points of, a, of agreement on factually what's going on with respect to China's role in the world. The question of how you deal with it, though, couldn't couldn't be more different. Um, and I think it's it's an area where we see uh, how the, the Biden approach, which is consistent with former, uh, former approaches that we've seen in Republican and Democratic administrations, um, would would deal with it on a multilateral level as well as a bilateral level, and that those two need to need to go together to be effective. Thanks, Tess. Um, if I can move us to our last topic, you brought up TPP, and I think it's very um, uh, important to focus on that as well too, which is the not just institutions but engagement, um, which is when it comes to multilateralism, national security alliances and trade um, and trade alliances ring large. Um, with the abandonment, abandonment of TPP um, and early attacks on NATO as obsolete, um, where goes our national security and our trade relationships and the interlinkages between the two, such as in TPP, um, as a tool toward um, addressing some regional issues of regional instability? And I'll start with you, Tess. Um. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I, I think I've, I've hopefully just made uh, exactly that case <laughs> um, that you know we we need regional tools and and both bilateral and multilateral partnerships um, in order to 
to write the rules that will benefit us. Uh, and to, and that means both from an economic perspective, looking, you know, narrowly at, at U.S. economic interests, uh, but also taking a broader view of U.S. interests and looking at, you know, what kind of labor rules, what kind of environmental rules, uh, you know, what what does our, our trade and, and national security system look like going forward that, um, you know, benefits not only our narrow economic interests, but, but increases stability uh, from a national security perspective, increases stability from a perspective of addressing climate change, uh, and increases security from a perspective of having alliances, right, at all, that we can count on uh, to, to address any number of challenges, those that we are, are uh, presented with right now and those that may arise in the future that we're just beginning to understand. Um, so uh, I, I guess I would, I would put the, the, um, the challenge out to, to, um, to say I, I'm not sure what, what the alternative view advocates for in that regard that would actually be effective. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a place, I think, where the, the choice is incredibly stark. Um, I will leave it at that for now, but happy to, to come back on anything more specific uh, in that regard uh, as, as, a, as a response to, to what my co-panelists may have to offer. Well, yeah. Uh... I don't know what I have to offer, uh, but uh, well, here's here's the issue with um, whether it's TPP or uh, uh, NATO being obsolete. Um, you know, I think again it goes back to whether you take these positions in order to transform them or reform them into something that is acceptable. The the danger with agreeing because it's uh, it's the uh, the the I guess the popular thing to do because other states are are joining is that if you don't believe in it, then it's going to crumble. It's not going to be enforced. There are countless of international agreements that are out there that that nations are signing up, but have yet to follow. But they sign it to be seen to be signing these documents and these agreements, and that and that's the danger. So I would I personally respect a country saying. No, I'm not going to be part of this because either they don't believe it or they don't think they can honor it rather than signing it and being part of it. And then we have to go back and that they're, they're cheating or whatever they, they may be doing. So I, I think with all of these agreements, and I can't speak to particulars on any one at this moment, but I think it's important that when you go in it, you have to believe in it and be willing to, to honor it 100%. Otherwise, we're wasting everyone's everyone's time, and I think that's part of the problem that the the president is trying to to address. And again, we can talk about whether he's doing it the right way or not, but that is part of the problem with many of these agreements. They've been signed up to, but countries are not honoring their commitments, and and some of them never intended to do so. So so this is something that the next administration will have to, and and subsequent administrations will have to to tackle. Thanks, Pierre. I think if I can, I assume your comments go by extension to uh, issues related to arms control uh, as well, um, but I'll let you react to that. Yeah, yeah, they do. Ex ex exactly. You know, because uh, you do have a situation, let's say arms control, where we may be signing something in, in completely good faith and are, are, are prepared to meet our commitments. Then you'll see nations, whether it's whether it's Russia, China or, or whomever else, uh, that is uh, either has a lower commitment or is not even honoring their lower commitment. And, and then, then it makes you wonder, well, why, why are we doing this? If they're not doing it, why, why are we doing it? And, and it goes back to one of the points that Tess made earlier is then you, you have to explain that to your people, your constituents, the, 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 the middle class or, or, or whatever you want to call it within your country, and, and explain why are we taking certain positions that other people are not? The answer may be because it's the right thing to do. You know, that may be. Or, or the answer may be to know we're going to pull back and try to balance, balance it out. I guess I would just yes. challenge, oh, I, would, I would briefly challenge that, that notion though, that pulling back helps in that situation, right? Do we, do we kind of go and, um, and 
pout in our corner, essentially, is what it looks like with some of these pullbacks uh, and, and say, no fair, no fair, and point the finger? Or do we join with our allies and our partners and, and try to use the levers that we have at our disposal to enforce the rules of the road that other states have agreed to? Uh, I would say that you know one of, one of the ways we do that also is through consistency on our own end um, and through exact, I couldn't agree with you more, Pierre, in terms of um, believing in what we're signing up to. I think that is absolutely crucial. Um, we, we are in, in uh, I think, in, in no danger of that uh, uh, being uh, abused in a Biden administration. I think he is a, a genuine believer that there are uh, global problems that require global solutions and that we have to negotiate answers. Now, will they always be perfect? Will they always reflect the ideal set of, uh, you know, rules that vindicate every U.S. interest in the way that we want? No. But the question is, what's what's the alternative and is it better? Uh, is it better to be outside in our corner pointing fingers or is it better to be at least partway there and working towards full realization uh, of what those interests are using the levers that we have by virtue of our relationships, uh, by virtue of the power of our economy would combined with the economies uh, of other democracies, uh, by virtue of uh, you know, being able to use the tools of international law when we remain within these, uh, these structures rather than outside of them. Uh, so I think, and, and uh, you know, I think Russia um, is a great example of um, where we can both kind of see a, a need to use other democracies and our, our position in the world to, to have a united front in terms of countering some of those activities in the arms control arena and otherwise, um, certainly with respect to Ukraine, with respect to cyber theft, other issues as well, uh, but also where we can find areas of cooperation if we stay engaged. You know, working on uh, some of our nonproliferation goals with Russia has been extremely successful. You look at working with the OPCW and, and Syria in terms of um, getting rid of their chemical weapons. If you look at the JCPOA, which uh, I think many of us uh, saw as a success until the U.S. withdrew, it was through staying engaged and working even with uh, potential adversaries like Russia that we were able to make progress. So I see that the time has ticked up, and I will stop there um, and turn it back over to you, Dave. And I would just say those uh, uh, excellent exchange and uh, worthy uh, issues to contemplate as we think about the implication of life without open skies and INF and potentially without a new start extension. So um, I think we are out of time. I just want to say thank you again to both of you uh, for your time, for your thoughts. Uh, and thank you to ASOL and again, Catherine, for putting this together. Um, and back to you. Thank you so much, um, Tess, Pierre, David. Thank you so much for your thoughtful and lively takes on some of the toughest questions, I think, around multilateralism, the US role in the world. The discussion, I think, brought out both points of common ground and points of difference. And in that way, brings our US election series to a close very eloquently. So thank you for spending this time with us. It's much appreciated.